Welcome in, everyone. Today we're taking a deep dive, a deep dive into Elizabeth Holmes. Oh, yeah. Um, and specifically, you know, what her life is going to be like uh, now. Right. That she's traded her black turtlenecks for a prison jumpsuit at federal prison camp in Bryan, Texas. Yeah. So, um, I mean, before we get into sort of the specifics of, of what that actually means. Okay. Um, can we can we just take a step back and you know just for anyone who who needs a little bit of a refresher just remind everyone sort of why why this story is so fascinating. Sure. So Elizabeth Holmes, um, you know, was once the youngest self-made uh, female billionaire um, because of her company Theranos. Right. And they promised to revolutionize healthcare with this you know brand new blood testing technology. Yeah. But um, but it was all you know it was House of Cards basically. Yeah yeah a House of Cards built on. Um... It was a lie. Yes. It was a lie and you know she was convicted on multiple counts of fraud. So all right. she's now less known for disrupting healthcare and more for for I mean perpetrating one of the biggest corporate scandals. Absolutely yeah one of the biggest corporate scandals in recent history. In recent history. Yeah. And I feel like you know. It, it makes you kind of wonder what, like, what lies beneath the surface of, you know. Right. A lot of these, like, dazzling success stories. That, oh, like... absolutely. I mean, her case really just sort of ripped the Band-Aid off this this tendency uh, to just blindly trust people who, you know, project this aura of success, particularly in a place like Silicon Valley, where it's all yeah. about disruption and you know, being revolutionary and all that. Right. It's it's a cautionary tale for sure. And now she's facing the consequences head on within the walls of federal prison camp in Bryan, Texas. Yeah. So, I mean, what what can you tell us about this facility? So, Camp Bryan, it's designated as minimum security, okay. um, which means that it's going to have fewer physical restrictions um, than you might find in a higher security prison. But, and, and let me be clear, I mean, even minimum security is going to be a huge lifestyle change for someone like Holmes who's used to Right. To private jets and, you know. Right. Yeah. Far far cry from the world that she once ruled. Wow. So, I mean, what what are some of like the, the most drastic sort of day to day changes? It's it's a complete one eighty. Yeah. You know, she is going from you know, whatever she wanted to she's waking up six AM. Oh gosh. To a schedule, you know, she's sharing communal bathrooms. Wow. She's gonna be working a job that pays Pennies an hour. Yeah, we're talking about someone who was, you know, the head of a multi-billion-dollar company, and now is making, you know, cents on the dollar, literally. Exactly, and, yeah. and that—that's where the real impact, I think, is going to be felt. Is because it's not just a loss of freedom; it's, it's a complete dismantling of of this identity that she built for herself. Right, right. It's it's like a Greek tragedy almost, isn't it? The higher they rise, the further they fall. Like, oh, absolutely. And I think this, you know, it's not just about her downfall. I think it really forces us all to kind of look at our own, maybe our own fascination with, with success. Right. Even if it's built on, you know. Lies. Lies, exactly. So you mentioned the work program. So so can you, you know, how does that work? Like, what, what would she even be doing? So federal prisons have this system. It's called inmate performance pay. Mm -hmm. They call it IPP. Um, it's, it's basically a tiered system, right? Mm -hmm. So inmates, they start at this lowest tier, and they're earning literally cents per hour for like, you know, food service, maintenance, that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, now, Holmes, she might qualify for something called Unicor, and that's federal prison industries. And basically, um, inmates, they're producing goods and services for, you know, government contracts. Okay. And the pay is slightly better there, but we're still only talking a couple bucks a day at most. Which when you, you know, and she w would order to pay $452 million right. in restitution. It's It's an impossible sum to repay on a prison salary. Right. So that that almost seems insurmountable at that point. It really is. And and the reality is, you know, most inmates, they leave prison with significant debt. Right. Which makes it that much harder to rebuild your life. You know, it's like this terrible cycle. Right. That's really hard to break free from. And it, it makes you wonder then if you can never realistically repay. I mean, is the punishment, does it really fit the crime? Yeah, it's it's a question with with really big implications, right? And it's something you know we should be thinking about, especially yeah. with white collar crime, right? I mean, you know, in Holmes's case, like, yeah, the financial ramifications are huge, right? But but the erosion of trust, yeah, in medical innovation that that has such far reaching consequences, right? You can't put a price on that, and and a prison sentence doesn't really address that. Totally, and it and it makes me think about the psychological impact, right? Right. I mean, this is someone, Elizabeth Holmes, who thrived on control. 
on being in charge, on calling the shots, dictating the narrative. And and now she's in an environment where literally every aspect of her life is controlled. Right. Every like every minute is scheduled out for her. It's it's a level of control I think that most of us can't even really wrap our heads around. Right. right? And and just imagine that psychological shift, right? Yeah. She went from you know, leading board meetings. Right. To now she's she's navigating the social hierarchy of prison. Oh, God. We're, we're, we're even making eye contact at the wrong time. Yeah. You know, can have consequences. It's it's like entering a whole new world with a whole new set of rules like that are just so different from. I mean, she moved through the world. Right. With such ease, you know, whatever she wanted. Oh, yeah. So so what would you say is like the most jarring adjustment? I think a loss of autonomy by far. OK. I mean, just. Every single aspect of your life is dictated by, by someone else. Wow! From when you eat to when you use the bathroom, there are there are studies that show that this kind of institutionalization, like it can lead to you know anxiety, depression, even PTSD. Wow! In some cases, and and then there's the constant surveillance. Oh, I, I was reading in the prison handbook. It was saying uh, they do inmate counts multiple times a day. Right. It's like you're always being watched. Yeah, precisely. And that that constant scrutiny. I mean, imagine. Yeah. It's got to be so psychologically taxing right. to know that everything you do is being, you know, tracked and recorded and analyzed. Right. I mean. Most people would find that incredibly unsettling. Totally. It's like that. It's almost like that panopticon effect, right? Exactly. Exactly. Where it's like just the possibility that you're being watched. It changes how you behave. Yeah. You're you're always aware. Right. Of the potential consequences. Right. Of every little thing you do. And and on top of all of that, she's separated from her family. Right. Her loved ones. And that's huge. Yeah. I mean, that isolation on top of everything else. Absolutely. Because yeah. social connection it's essential for for anyone's well-being. Right. And and in prison that's that's really restricted. Yeah. You know, right. visits are limited, phone calls, they're monitored. Right. And you know, for someone who's used to having this close circle of friends and family, right. I mean, that lack of genuine connection, it can be incredibly isolating. It it really makes you realize that prison like even when it's minimum security, yeah. it's not just about, you know, being physically locked up. No. It's about like taking away your autonomy, right. like your sense of who you are even. Yeah. Yeah. It really forces you. And forcing you to like just confront what you did. Absolutely. And and in, in Holmes's case, you know, right. what she did, I mean, it extends way beyond the prison walls. Oh, for sure. Like the damage she caused to investors and right. the medical community and and just like pu- public trust and innovation. Right. I mean, that's that's something she's going to carry with her. Yeah. Long after she gets out. I, it's just it's almost unfathomable, yeah. like how someone could like create this massive fraud and and seemingly believe that right. that the rules just didn't apply. Right, and that's I think the complex thing about yeah. white collar crime is yeah. that oftentimes there's this disconnect right. between the crime itself and the harm it causes. Right, like they think they're playing a different game. Right. With with different rules, exactly, and and it's a game they ultimately end up losing. They do, yeah. And and Holmes is as we, as we see here. Yeah, and I think her story. I mean, it's a really stark reminder. Yeah, that that real success really? is built on integrity. Yeah, it's not built on deception. Right, because no matter how convincing the facade, exactly, the truth is going to come out eventually. It always does, yeah. And and in in her case, like that truth has led to just. I mean, this really dramatic fall from grace. It's, yes. a, it's a complete dismantling of everything that she built. It is. It's a stunning um, turn of events. And it, it really, I think, forces us to ask, like, yeah. OK, considering like how big this deception was right. and how much damage it caused, right. does does the punishment really fit the crime? Right. And yeah, like, I, is that really justice? That's that's a question that I don't think there's an easy answer for. Okay. And one that I mean, we're going to see you know, legal scholars and just, you know, the public years debating for years to come. It's it makes us look at our values. Like, how do we define justice? Yeah. What does it mean to really be held accountable? Especially when what you did had such a huge impact. Exactly. Yeah. A lot to unpack there. A lot to unpack. Well, um, 
This has been this has been quite a deep dive. It has. Um, but you know, I I really appreciate you, you know, taking us through Of course, happy to be here. The complexities of of Elizabeth Holmes and this whole case and and what prison is even like. Yeah. For her and and I hope, you know, that our listeners will will keep thinking about these questions even as we as we sign off here. Absolutely. So until next time, everyone, stay curious. Stay curious. Stay informed. And and maybe don't don't be afraid to question things. Exactly. Every now and then. All right. Well, we'll see you next time. See you next time.